Um, yeah, so yeah, thanks, Pedro. I'm, I'm Brian Hewlett. I'm a, I'm a software engineer here at Google, and um, I actually work on a team where I'm, I'm lucky enough to I just get to contribute to Apache Beam. So I, I've become an Apache Beam committer. Um, and yeah, I'm going to be talking about the data frame API, which you know lets you work with pandas-like data frames in order to build Apache Beam pipelines. Um, so first off, I just want to sort of talk about it at a high level. Um, so the you know the goal of the of the Beam data frame API is to provide a, a pandas compatible API that lets users build Apache Beam pipelines. Um, and if you're not familiar with pandas, that's okay. I think you know this this should be low enough level that you'll kind of be able to pick it up. But I suspect that you know if you've used if you you know if you've done data analytics in Python and you know in the last ten years that you probably know what pandas is. Um, you know it's it's a wildly popular data analytics library. Um, and it's it's really great and easy to use, and you know a lot of people know how to how to use it. Um, and so our, you know our goal with the data frame API is to make it so that rather than building up your Beam pipeline with you know the traditional SDKs, the Java SDK or the Python SDK, you can build your pipeline using this Pandas API, um, which is sort of higher level and you know more declarative. And then you know we are responsible for sort of turning that into a Beam pipeline for you. Um, and so, you know, our, our goal is for the Beam Data Frame API to be, you know, totally compatible with, like, you know, anything you can do in Pandas. We want you to be, be able to do with Beam Data Frames, um, and that, you know, there are some caveats that I'll, to that that I'll get into. Um, but you know, overall, our goal is, you know, we want we want them to be sort of completely compatible. Um, the one thing though that won't change that's that will probably always be a difference between Pandas and Beam Data Frames is that Beam Data Frames are a deferred API. Um, and so this gets into sort of you know the pros and cons of Beam data frames versus native data frames in pandas. Um, so in the you know native data frames are great because it, it's sort of eagerly executed and you you know you you have all of your data there in memory. And then when you do some computation, you know pandas goes off and computes it and then brings back the result immediately and you can look at it. Um, and it makes it really easy to sort of interactively do this sort of processing. Um, but the con there is that you need to be able to fit all of your data in memory. Um, and the, so you can only process as much data as you can fit in memory on your local machine. Uh, whereas with Beam data frames, our entire goal is for this to be able to be scaled up. Um, so we want you to be able to process very large distributed data sets using a Beam runner. Um, and so the, you know, the caveat there though, is that then you, it's a little bit more difficult to work with this deferred API, but then you get that benefit of, of being able to do, you know, large scale distributed processing. Um, the other thing I wanted to call out about Beam data frames is that, you know, they, it, it's this sort of higher level API. So it, ends, it tends to be easier for people to use than just normal Beam Python, which can be a little bit sort of lower level. Um, and also, you know, it actually ends up often being more performant than a similar pipeline written in, in straight Beam Python. Um, and that's because we actually use the pandas library itself on your worker nodes that are executing and, and computing partial results. Um, and, you know, the pandas library is actually, you know, it's a very good execution engine. It's really good at, at um, single threaded processing of in-memory data, uh, which is what we need on workers. So, you know, using the data frame API actually can, can be a performance win as well in addition to being easier to use. Um, so first off, I just wanted to give this sort of visual introduction and, and comparison of, of the pandas data frames versus beam data frames and I'll highlight some of the differences. Um, so this is, you know, if you're not familiar, this is what some, some code might look like in using working with pandas data frames. You know, first you need to import the library, of course, um, and then built into pandas, you have all of these read functions. So there's like read CSV and read parquet, and they can all read data files that you have locally on your machine. And they output a pandas data frame, which is, you know, here I've stored it as this DF variable. Um, and then on this pandas data frame, you can do all sorts of operations. So um, here, what we're doing is, you know, assuming that the CSV has like a foo and a bar column, this is how you might do like a grouped aggregation to compute, you know, the sums of the sum of the foo values grouped by the values in the bar column, um, and then we write that out to another data frame we're calling ag here, um, and then finally you can write that result out to a CSV 
or you know what other, any other file type that Pandas supports, um, and you, you just write it out to a file on your local machine. So with Beam, you know things it looks um, mostly the same, but there's a little bit of difference. Uh, you know, obviously we we do a different import. We import this function from Panda or from from Beam instead of importing it from Pandas. Um, and you have to work with this pipeline object. So, you know, everything in Beam, we're, we're trying to build up a pipeline that then we're gonna go run on our, on our runner. Um, so you need to have a pipeline object. And then rather than reading and writing files on your local disk, we're gonna read and write files in cloud storage. Um, and that's because, you know, of course the Beam data from API, the goal is to be able to process these large distributed data sets that, that are you know, gonna be stored um, in, you know, remotely. Okay, um, so for the, I want to jump over to a notebook I have for doing a live demo of this. Um, so here I'm, I'm working in a, I think that looks okay, right? Yeah, so I'm, here I'm working in a um, notebook, um, a, a Jupyter notebook, and I'm going to be using uh, interactive Beam in order to sort of demonstrate how you can use the Beam data from API. Um, Interactive Beam is a, another is a you know a tool within Beam that we have that sort of integrates Beam with this notebook environment. So it lets you kind of makes it easier to um, interactively build a Beam pipeline and kind of inspect results. Um, and you know it works well with the Data Frame API. So it's a nice way to sort of prototype a, a pipeline that you're trying to build with Data Frames um, in a notebook environment. Uh, so the data set I'm going to be working with is this, you know, the popular NYC taxi ride data set uh, that we have hosted on in Apache Beam samples bucket. Um, there's, you know, we have a bunch of data there. I also have, there's these, there are some sample files that just have, you know, small subsets of the data. So here we have the, um, this is just like the first 10,000 records um, that are staged there that I'm going to sort of process to, to prove out my analytics. Um, and here, if we peek at that data set, we can see that, you know, it's just, it's just a standard CSV file and each row is, you know, represents some metadata from a taxi ride, like the number of passengers that were picked up, when and where, like when they got dropped off, when they got picked up, how much they paid, how much they tipped, stuff like that. Um, so in order to, to process this with Beam data frames, first I'm going to build a Beam pipeline and I'm going to use the interactive runner, which lets me use these interactive Beam features. Um, and then I can go ahead and start making uh, Beam data frame objects. So I'm going to use the, the read CSV function and, and pass in the, you know, the file path that I want to process. And that produces this, this Beam data frame object. Um, and then if we, we print that out, we can see this is an instance of, of deferred data frame. So you know, we explicitly call it a, a deferred data frame because this is a, a deferred object that we're not eagerly executing like, like Pandas does. Um, but you know what you can see is that we um, we do know what the names of the columns are. So we uh, when you call read CSV, we actually sort of Beam takes a peek at the start of the data, the first you know few hundred rows, and it figures out what the names of the columns are, and then also the data types of the columns. And so that helps us know you know while you're building your Beam pipeline, then we know what operations are valid for you to do, um, and so we can sort of validate your pipeline as you're building it. Um, and then when you actually go run it, you know, we can be sure that it's actually going to work on a distributed runner. Um, yeah, and so then, you know, we can start to do some analytics. So here I'm, I'm creating a new pandas object that represents sort of a, a grouped aggregation. So I'm taking the passenger counts and I want to group that based on the hour when passengers were picked up. So then we can kind of see, you know, when, when in the day are people getting, getting their rides. Um, and what that produces is another one of these, it's a, instead of a deferred data frame, now it's a deferred series object. Um, a series is what a pan, what pandas calls an individual column in a data frame. Um, so we have, you know, we only have one column here, so it's called a, a, ser a series and in Beam we have a deferred series object. And again, you know, we know what the data type is, we know what the name of this series is, but you know, unlike pandas, when you print it out, you don't see the data. We just, we just see like what the, the sort of metadata about it. Um, but then what we can do with interactive beam is you can call this ib.collect function. 
And ivy.collect is a school utility that you can use you know, in a notebook environment. You can pass it a P collection, or you can also pass it one of these deferred series or deferred data frame objects. And it's gonna go ahead and run the pipeline and bring the results back into memory in your, in your notebook environment. Um, so I, I passed it my deferred series, and this actually brings back a concrete pandas series that then we can look at. Um, and so we can see, you know, the, the analytic worked. We got some counts based on uh, the pickup hour, the, the hour that people got picked up. Um, it looks a little bit odd because there's like, you know, the, a lot more pickups in the morning hours than there are in the evening hours. And probably that's because of the way we've sampled the data. You know, we're just looking at the first 10,000 rows and, you know, maybe that's only rides that are in the morning or something. Um, but yeah, you know, that'll, that'll go away once we scale this up. So the next thing I wanted to show is that, you know, we can, you know, in pandas, you can do, you know, all sorts of operations. You can do arithmetic operations. There's all sorts of, you know, other things that you can do here. And, and we try as much as possible to support that. So um, what I, what I'm demonstrating here is you take, I wanted to try to look at, you know, how are people tipping throughout the day? Um, and so I take the amount that they, that the customers have tipped divided by the total cost of their rides. That gives us like the tip ratio, which, you know, if, if everybody's tipping 20%, then like every row here would be like 0.2. Um, and then I'm going to take that tip ratio and group it and find the, you know, the average tip uh, ratio for every hour of the day. And that just produces another one of these deferred series objects. And then again, we can call ivy.collect on that to kind of see what it looks like and get the actual data set back. And we can see that, you know, people tend to be tipping around like 10%. There does seem to be some sort of variation there over the day. And if we plot it, you know, it looks like there's a trend here. Um, it kind of looks cleaner in the morning and then in the evening it gets, or in the afternoon, it gets very noisy probably because there's not, there's not much data there. Um, so yeah, so I guess the next thing I want to do is, is take these analytics and scale them up, use a distributed runner to, to run those analytics on the full data set. Um, so the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to actually use data flow. You know, I'm a Google engineer. I know how to use data flow, but you know, with beam, you can use any, any distributed runner here. If you have access to a Flink cluster or spark cluster, you could just use one of those, one of those runners instead. Um, so I'm just going to build up a new pipeline that's pointing to the data flow runner. Let's just take a peek at our input data set here. So this is the, in the Apache Beam samples bucket, we have this 2018 directory with all of the data from that year. And then, um, you know, I can basically just sort of copy paste everything that I, that I proved out with the interactive beam. So, you know, I'm going to again, do this read CSV, except now we're reading from the 2018 uh, data files. And you can see that produces this beam data frame that has inferred the data types appropriately. And then we can do those same analytics, computing the tip ratio and the passengers. And then finally, what I want to do is, um, you know, since I'm not going to be running this in interactive beam and not using the ip.collect anymore, I, I need to write these results out somewhere. So I'm going to use the, the pandas to CSV function to write both of these series out to CSV files that then I can look at later. And then we'll go ahead and run that pipeline and send it off. Um, so this is going to take a few minutes to run because it's, you know, it's got to go send off the job to Dataflow, which has to spin up the workers and, and execute everything. So while that's running, I'm going to go back to my slides and I want to talk a little bit more about what's going on under the hood. Um, so yeah, what I, what I want to dig into is here is, you know, what happens when you call run um, on a pipeline that you've built using the data frame API. Um, and so first off, I guess I just want to step back and show you to sort of establish some visual language here just by talking by looking at like what happens with pandas. Um, so with pandas, you know, when you call the pandas read CSV function, it gives you this data frame out, which is this in memory object. Um, and we can sort of visualize it like this. Um, Let's just pretend for now, I guess, that our, our CSV just has these two columns. The, it has a pickup hour column and a passenger count column. So then the, the data frame that you get in has those two columns um, with all of their data in it. And then the data frame also has an index associated with it. Every, every pandas 
object, whether it be a data frame or a series, always has one of these indexes. Um, and sometimes it's uh, meaningful. Other times, like in this case, where often where you just read it from some input file, it's actually, you know, Pandas just generated it for you as this sort of one-up counter. Um, and the idea there is just to have some, some unique identifier for every row. Um, so then in pandas, once you take that data frame object and, and do a computation on it, it's going to return you another one of these objects. Um, and then in this case, we can see that, you know, we have one column now that's the passenger counts. And then we also, now the index actually has meaning. So the index represents the hour that the customer was picked up. Um, and so, uh, you know, that's sort of, sort of how pandas works there. So jumping over to Beam, you know, if you use the Beam analogs for, the, for all of these operations, when you call read CSV, you know, again, we peek at the data, we know what the shape of the data frame is going to be, but we don't have any of the actual data yet. Um, and then similarly, you know, once you do a computation, we Beam figures out what the, what the result is going to look like. So it knows there's going to be an index called with a name pickup hour and a single column named passenger count, but, you know, it doesn't actually have any of that data. Uh, and so, uh, you know, we don't actually look at the data until you call pipeline.run and send this all off to your distributed runner. Um, so what I want to dive into is, you know, what, what happens then when you, when you send it off to the runner. So we can kind of visualize it this way. So, you know, we have, we have our data set in cloud storage, so, you know, the Apache beam samples, uh, bucket, and then let's just say that each one of these little stacks of servers here represents kind of one, one worker node that's going to be processing your, your data set. Um, so what happens is each worker node gets assigned some partition of that input um, of the overall input data set. Um, you know, we might kind of visualize it this way. This is, you know, a little bit of a, of a fake out, I guess, but you might say that like, each the for the worker on the left gets assigned rows zero to 999. The one in the middle gets a thousand to 1999, and then the one on the right is like 2,000 on. Um, you know, in, in practice, what happens is each one just gets assigned sort of some chunk of bytes from the input of the overall data set. Um, and then if we so if we zoom in on one of these workers, what it's actually doing is under the hood, it's actually going to be using the pandas library. So it um, we look at the say the middle worker here, it's going to take that read CS, it's going to take those bytes that it has been assigned from the overall input data set, and it's going to process those actually with the pandas read CSV function and produce a concrete pandas data frame. Um, and then it's going to go ahead and actually do your computation on it. So the computation that you want to do, which, you know, this grouped aggregation, it's going to go ahead and, and take that partial data set and compute an aggregation for it. Um, and so it's, you know, it's, it's using the pandas library to sort of do this computation. Um, but that, you know, so this just represents sort of the intermediate result for this worker's portion of the data, right? So all of the other workers are also doing this and they have their own counts that we need to then, we need to combine together. So what we do is we actually partition the data set based on the index. Um, so this is how, you know, we, this is how we always parallelize everything in the data frame API is we, we partition your data based on the index. And so in, in this case, what that might look like is, you know, we say pick up hour zero, one, two goes to one, uh, one data frame, pick up hour three, four, five goes to another, and then six, seven, eight, and so on up through 28, or sorry, 28, 23. Um, and then we zoom back out, every worker is going to be doing this, right? So, so every worker is kind of producing this set of data frames that represent the passenger counts for different hours. Um, and then we need to co-locate them. So we need to bring all of the zero one twos onto a single worker and then similarly for the other hours. So, you know, the way we do that in Beam is with a, a group by key. So that um, the data frame API would insert a group by key here which then if we look at the output side of that is going to bring all of the 0, 1, 2s together, the 3, 4, 5s, the 6, 7, 8s, et cetera. And so now each worker is going to read in the, you know, the appropriate data set for one set of hours. Um, and then it's trivial for it to sort of line all these up and, you know, get the total count. Um, so each worker is going to sort of get that total count and then write the result out 
to the result uh, result bucket um, as a as a CSV file. So I know that might be a lot. That was like <laughs> that was pretty quick, and you know you probably have a lot of questions of like how do we know where to put the group by key and stuff like that. Um, but I guess the the things that I want people the thing that I want people to take away from this is that you know unlike pandas data frames when you're working with these beam data frame objects you know it's a little bit harder to work with because it's a deferred API but the advantage that you get is that we are able to distribute the work and process it with you know a cluster of machines um, on a distributed runner um, and the other takeaway that I want you to get from it is that you know as much as possible we're actually leveraging pandas itself. Um, so, you know, Pandas is a really good, efficient, um, single threaded execution engine on in-memory data. And so we're, we're using that on, your, on the workers. And basically what we're doing is we just insert these group by keys wherever it's necessary in order to do analytics on your entire data set. Um, yeah, so let's jump back to the notebook now. I think that should be done. Oh, no, it's still running. Shoot. Um, well, let me jump to my last slide. Yeah, and in the meantime, we also have a couple of questions. Um, one is from Anna. Uh, she wants to confirm if you can do, merge uh, different files as like if they were left joints in SQL with the Beam Data Frames API. Yeah, so there are there are a few tools for that. There's um, in in pandas, there's a function called merge and a function called join um, that let you do those sorts of join operations. And we have a uh, there's actually an example in this Apache Beam .examples .data frame package. One of the examples in there shows um, how you can do that. Awesome. And from Pierre, we have a question: Can the Beam Data Frame API be executed on Spark as a runner? And is that the Spark data frame used in that context? So yes and no. You you can use the Beam data frame API on Spark, um, but it's not going to yeah it's not going to sort of translate things over to like Spark data frames in any way. Okay. So it, it uses its its own implementation of that data frame API. Exactly. Yeah. So it, it would execute in the same way that that I just demonstrated there, where it's actually using pandas for for execution. Awesome. OK, please carry on. Oh, sorry. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, I appreciate that. Um, yeah, so it looks like the, the pipeline just finished. Um, so I'm going to use Interactive Beam here to actually pull, read back in those CSVs that were written out and, and plot the results. Um, and so now we can see, you know, there do seem to be some trends here that are kind of interesting. So like, for whatever reason, there's this sharp drop at like 4 a.m. that like people don't want to tip very much, and then during you know the morning commute and and around like 10 o'clock, there's kind of a peak in how much people are tipping, um, and you know we can see sort of uh, similar but different trend in sort of the number of passengers and and when they're being when they're getting rides. Um, so the last thing I wanted to highlight is, you know, I mentioned this at the beginning that there are a few, you know, our goal is to be sort of 100% compatible with pandas, but there are a few um, things that we don't have implemented in Beam. Um, and that's just because, you know, pandas is, is this eagerly executed API and there's some things that it makes sense to do in that environment where you have all of your data in memory that are actually like very, very difficult to, <laughs> to parallelize or, or even impossible. Um, and so there, you know, there are a few classes of operations that, um, that we don't support and we always, you know, we try to detect when you use these cases and we will raise an error and like, and let you know that like, this is something that is not going to work or it might work with caveats. Um, so, but the important thing is that, you know, we're going to tell you about this while you're building your pipeline. It's not something that's going to like error out when you, once you send it to the runner, um, so some examples of this are things like if you try to compute the mode, um, the, you know, computing the mode is something that is difficult or, you know, I mean, it might even be impossible to parallelize in an exact way. Uh, so the, currently we, we will let you compute the mode, but the way we're going to do it when we actually execute it is it's going to bring all of the data onto a single node. 
Um, and so in that sense, you know, you're going to need to be able to fit all of your data in memory on one, one of your worker machines. Um, and so we try to warn you about this, so that, you know, that's going to be a limitation here. And if you're sure, you know, say that you know that the, the data set that you're passing to mode is going to be relatively small and it'll fit in memory, then you can kind of opt into it and say, you know, that, that's okay. I, um, I want to go ahead and do that. And you can use this by using this uh, context that we've provided that lets you opt in. Um, another couple of classes of operations that are going to raise errors are these order sensitive operations. So this is things like doing a diff or interpolation or a cumulative sum. And that's because, you know, every, every pandas data frame, all like whether you've imposed an order or not, it always has an implicit order because it's, it's just there in memory in, in some particular order. Um, but with beam data frames, you know, since we're working on these distributed data sets, we're, you know, we're often working on data that doesn't have an imposed order. Um, and so then it's, it's sort of ambiguous. What, what, like, what order do you want the data in when we do a diff um, of like, you know, the previous operation to the, or from one row to the next. Um, and so one thing we're considering here is like, we can let you impose an order and then do these operations. Um, but, you know, that's, that's something that, that we haven't prioritized yet. And then another thing is, uh, you know, like I, I showed you earlier, when I brought the data set back into memory in the notebook, I was able to use this plotting operation. Um, but if you try to call that plot operation on a deferred series or a deferred data frame, that's, you know, it, it's not going to work because, you know, we don't have the data there to, to make the plot. Um, but this is also something, you know, we've been considering how we could work around. And, you know, one thing we might do is just, you know, when you call plot, we would just go ahead and run the pipeline and bring the data back and make a plot for you. Um, and, you know, so these are all things that like that we, we could do. Um, and certainly if you run into them and they're things that you want us to improve, like, you know, please like reach out to us and let us know, file a JIRA or comment on an existing one or, or mention it in the user at Beam or, or dev at Beam lists. Um, it definitely helps a lot to, for us to prioritize these things if, if people ask for them. So, um, yeah, I we, think that is all I had. We have one more question from, uh, I don't know if it's Al or AI. <laughs> um, okay. When reading data from BigQuery in terms of performance and costs in general, how much attention should you pay to doing joins directly in being in BigQuery versus merges in, in Beam data frame. Um, that's. I mean, I think maybe it just sort of depends on the scale of data that you're working with. But you know, I, I think always like if you can do the join in BigQuery itself, it's it's probably going to be better than what you can do in Beam. Um, and. So you know, this is something that we've even, even been considering doing in, in Beam is like optimizing your pipeline where like if you write a pipeline where you're reading from two BigQuery sources and trying to join them, um, you know, ideally we'd, we could even like change that into one read from BigQuery where we ask BigQuery to do the join and then, and then read that data out. Um, so yeah, I think, but you know, I mean, obviously, like if you're working with like a relatively small data set, like it's probably not going to make that much difference whether you do it in, in Beam or in BigQuery, but like it probably still would be better in, in BigQuery. Okay. Um, but where you're where you're going to see a benefit is, you know, in, in BigQuery, you can't join, you know, or it might be more difficult to join your um, non BigQuery data set with your, your BigQuery data set or do some kind of like streaming thing or, um, you know, with Beam, we can be much more flexible. Okay, thank you so much, Brian, and thanks everybody for joining. We'll see you in the next session of BIM College.